Katarina Yakov watched the German soldiers flee. Streaming from the east, that's what she was seeing. Allied bombers flew above them. She thought they all might die, and then soon there was the silence of all the SS men. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katarina Yaka saw red flags flapping in the breeze above the Russian tanks, and she fell upon her knees. And so many different voices in so many different tongues sang the most beautiful song that could ever have been sung. In German, Lithuanian, in Polish, and in Dutch, a myriad of melodies has never had been such. In Russian and in Yiddish, Italian and French, emerging from the forests beneath the trench. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang. The Internationale. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Völker hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale. Er kämpft das Menschenrecht. Völker hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale er kämpft das Menschenrecht. Hello and welcome to Revolutionary Socialist Review with Chris Driscoll and Rainer Shea. Uh, Rainer, how are you? How have you been? Uh, <laughs> this last month I've gone down quite an internet rabbit hole. Uh, I'll never be the same. Uh, it's the Chris Chan rabbit hole. Uh, this uh, creepy person uh, who got arrested this week for incest in the state of Virginia. Yamo and I were reacting to that this week. Uh, I wish he could be on, but me and him were, uh, were talking about that, uh, seemingly most of the internet, but like all, all, maybe all of the internet this week was reeling in shock at the appalling nature of this person's crimes. And it, it's been a long time coming. This is a long, like 20 year saga of this person getting up into antics. Chris, uh, Christine Weston Chandler uh, getting into antics on the internet. And uh, they basically created a, a communications feedback loop where they were getting trolled by 4chan and 4chan was giving them publicity or internet attention and that uh, progressively made them more famous now it's national news that uh, they get committed an incestuous crime incestuous like with a relative yeah yeah it it was it's reflective of the red flags that were there for decades huh uh and i never heard of this person um i've heard of 4chan but i've never heard of christine blah 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 chan uh so it shows how out of it i am in this kind of culture uh but <laughs> uh well uh arrested there you go okay with that Let's move on 
to the first of our many topics tonight. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm trying going to try to be brief, which is, as you know, quite difficult for me. Uh, but <laughs> I'll give it the old college try. <clears throat> first on the list, politics of spectacle. On the eve of the moratorium, uh, on the eve of uh, eviction moratorium suspension, basically, your uh, end, the end of it, uh, the squad talks the walk. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that not even the most progressive elected officials in the U.S., are willing to do what is necessary to meet the needs of the people. And this comes from Mint Press News, uh, August 3rd, uh, 2021, by uh, Daniel Haifang, who we all know as Danny. Danny Haifang. Hey, Danny Haifang has been on the show a couple times. Uh, he's always a favorite of mine. Uh, always enjoy his writing. And so I wanted to uh, raise this. This article, I, I'm not going to read it to you, you know, quotes or highlights or whatever, like I do, usually do. I'm just going to say that this in this article, Danny takes on the whole supposed progressive, uh, you know, which is really read liberal and supposed socialist. Uh, wing of the Congress uh, for basically uh, talking the walk, but not walking the talk. Uh, the, if the, their, race, their latest caper uh, has been uh, prior to July 31st, which was the end of the moratorium on uh, uh, evictions uh, that the uh, CDC had implemented under the uh, Trump regime, the prior regime. Um, and uh, it was uh, scheduled to end on the 31st. And in fact, it did end. Meanwhile, uh, while this was coming down back on the, uh, you know, in, in the weeks leading up to the 31st of J July, the uh, Congress uh, adjourned and went home. So right as the Congress adjourned, not before, not when they could actually do anything and use their power as Congress members to do something, who, people I call Congress criminals because they're all criminals in that U.S. Congress, uh, after they could actually do something, they pulled a big stunt of sleeping on the Capitol steps, uh, demanding that the rest of Congress come back and do something about uh, extending the eviction moratorium. And of course, this eviction moratorium came about because of... Uh, the uh, economic uh, blowback or fallout of uh, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. Danny really takes these people on and does it in a, in a great way. So I recommend reading this article and we will have the link listed under this video. So Rainer, thoughts? Lennon said that... Uh, the masses can't be ready for revolution until they've had the necessary political experience to see that uh, trying to work within the system is not going to uh, work out for them. The social Democrats are always going to betray them and the social Democrats aren't, uh, they, they aren't going to enact or be able to enact, even if they want to, the changes that will benefit the masses. Uh, so ultimately, the masses in this country are going to uh, come to the conclusion that uh, this solution that's been advertised to them uh, through these marketing campaigns like the campaign of AOC and the campaign of Bernie Sanders, uh, 
the squad. It's nothing more than uh, controlled opposition, if you can even call it opposition. Well put, well put, Brainer. Uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Lennon is correct. People have to go through the, these experiences. That's why I always point out to people that um, in the early phases of a radicalization, and we're certainly experiencing a radicalization today, uh, unlike I have never seen in my entire life, uh, and I was born in 1954, so unlike uh, any of those times, and I've read a lot of labor history and working class history and socialist history and communist history of the United States in particular, of the whole rest of the world, but in particular in, in this regard uh, of the United States, of the American empire. And I don't remember such a swift radicalization taking place. Now it's uneven. There's a big problem with lack of leadership. There's a big problem with lack of uh, organization. There are some organizations out there that could possibly uh, fill the breach, step into the breach and provide leadership if the working class chooses to choose them. And ultimately I think it will, or maybe the working class will throw up some new kind of leadership. I am convinced that that leadership will have to be Marxist Leninist it will have to be a Leninist type political party, meaning uh, a democratic centralist political party. And B, by the way, Democrat, uh, 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 social Democrat, we should mention that in the United States, because of the, because of the DSA, the Democratic Socialist uh uh, whatever the fuck they are, Democratic Socialist uh, Alliance or whatever the fuck they're called. Because of that, social Democrats in America call themselves Democratic Socialists. However, there's nothing Democratic about them other than the fact that they've got their heads really far up the ass of the Democrat Party. Um, and there's nothing socialist about them. They are really on the right wing of global social democracy. I mean, if you compared them to social democratic parties in Latin America, you'd be astounded because uh, typically so social democratic parties in Latin America tend to be fiercely anti-imperialist because if they weren't they'd never get elected at all uh still social democrats as you say uh you know i mean they're the ones you mentioned this last week uh rayner the social democrats are the ones that murdered um rosa luxembourg uh, one of the great leaders of uh of revolutionary socialism uh, in the early part of the last century, and uh, Karl Liebknecht, who was her political partner. Um, and uh, just a few weeks later, the same Social Democrat pukes uh, murdered 1,500 uh, other revolutionary socialists who were engaged in what revolutionary socialists and what all real socialists are supposed to do, which is revolution. So the, uh, they set the standard for social Democrats. Uh, next on the list, how US revolutionaries can survive the coming purge. And this comes from rainershade.com uh, published August 2nd, 2021. Uh, to find out how to survive as a revolutionary in this country in the coming decades, you need to look at the very 
most extreme cases of counter-revolutionary warfare, which is to say cases like Argentina and Indonesia and Nazi Germany, uh, where so many people were killed, uh, and a lot of them weren't even communists. These governments, th these, these dictatorships uh, carried out uh, mass murders, mass purges that were deliberately sloppy in who they targeted uh, because it seems like the less careful you are in, uh, in a counter-revolutionary purge, the more likely you are statistically to uh, catch up all the communists, all the real class conscious people. Uh, so there was this CIA facilitated genocide in Indonesia uh, that's especially uh, concerning because it's been used as a model for similar anti-communist purges throughout Latin America. And at some point, this is going to be replicated uh, right here. Uh, I mean, the, the, I think the only reason why uh, the a mass killings on this scale, mass political killings on the scale, haven't uh, happened uh, in the United States at least late, at least lately, because you know this country was founded on genocide, killing of tens of millions of natives, uh, is because it's the core of global imperialism. Uh, so that uh, that affords it the um, the well, how, how could you say the arm's length away from uh, an urgent revolutionary crisis? It's, uh, it's, it's relative prosperity and the uh, fortification, the strength of its, uh, its right-wing colonialist institutions are, are so strong that revolution has, uh, has for so long been such a distant possibility in this country. Uh, it's when a revolution becomes imminent, when uh, the foundations of imperialism fall out and the contradictions get so big that they prompt the masses to start organizing seriously towards revolution, that the government will take desperate measures and try to kill off potentially hundreds of thousands of people like they did in India, Indonesia in the 1960s to try to prevent a revolution on this continent. And that's when we'll need to uh, take drastic measures ourselves. It's when we'll need to adopt guerrilla evas evasive tactics, the kinds of tactics that are uh, now being laid out by the Houthis in Yemen. The Houthis are uh, under fire from a genocidal regime, Saudi Arabia, backed by the United States, uh, that's uh, carrying out a genocide against the Yemeni people. And uh, it has all the modern surveillance tools. And this has prompted uh, the Houthi rebels, the anti-imperialists, to uh, innovate on their established guerrilla tactics and uh, establish a paradigm of constant mobility. This article uh, quotes uh, another article that quotes a general who has observed that in the modern era, in the modern era of warfare, you need to move every few hours or you are dead. That's the reality that we're going to be facing if we're ever on the run. Uh, from these death squads or whatever other means that they use to try to kill us. Probably drones. <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah. I, as I always say in response to the, to, uh, these articles that you write, good article, by the way. Um, I, I really, I'm not too sure that that's the way things will happen in the United States. However, um, it is a possibility. I can't deny that. <clears throat> um, I want to also uh, recommend a book. It's called The Jakarta Method. And it, I read it last year's stupendous book. And it refers, of course, Jakarta refers to Jakarta uh, Indonesia, 
And it is uh, it's basically it's about this mass genocide uh, sponsored by the uh, U.S. government against uh, communist uh, forces, or at least they said it was against communist forces, although you're right to point out that a lot of these people who were murdered were not. Um, estimates of as many as a million people genocided in Indonesia. And this book, The Jakarta Method, um, goes on from there to describe how the American empire has replicated um, this experience and applied it in other parts of the American empire. Um, Indonesia, of course, was certainly a part of the American empire, and they were really freaked at that time uh, by the idea that uh, communism, uh, well, I'll put it to you this way, the Communist Party of Indonesia at that time prior to that had become the second largest uh, communist party in the world meaning, of course, that it was the second largest party of any type, political party in the world, uh, after the Chinese uh, Communist Party, of course, which was larger. Um, and the American uh, imperialists were freaked out about this, so they took drastic measures, and they will, uh, if they can, uh, take drastic measures like this. And that's the lesson of the Jakarta method. So uh, matter of fact, if I can remember this, hopefully I'll remember it when I'm uh, processing this, uh, this video tomorrow, I will include a link to um, the Jakarta method uh, for people to get a hold of it. Next on the list, Pedro Castillo has become, uh, he was uh, inaugurated as the president of Peru, Peru, as we Americans call it. Um, Castillo uh, is a member of the Free Peru Party, and he was a candidate of the Free Peru Party. That party describes itself as being a left-wing socialist organization that embraces Marxism, Leninism, and Mariateguism. <coughs> it values democracy, decentralization, internationalism, sovereignty, humanism, and anti-imperialism. Now, Castillo himself has said some things trying to distance himself from his own party, like uh, I will be governing, not the party, things like that. But uh, we will see if he's being genuine on that uh, score or if he uh, was just, uh, you know, uh, positioning himself to get votes. But in any case, he won. Uh, real tight election. He's now the president. Um, I want to also mention uh, Mariateguism, <coughs> which this party models itself after. It's named after Jose Carlos uh, Mariategue La Chira, who was born uh, 14 June 18. 94 and lived to 16 April 1930, meaning he only lived to be 35 years old, a real tragedy. Uh, he was a Peruvian intellectual, journalist, activist, and political philosopher, a prolific writer before his early death at the age of 35. He is considered one of the most influential Latin American socialists of the 20th century. Uh, Maria Tigue's seven interpretive essays on Peruvian reality, uh, published 1928, is still widely read in Latin America and called one of the broadest, deepest, and most enduring works of, Latin, of the Latin American century. 
an avowed self-taught Marxist, he insisted that a socialist revolution should evolve organically in Latin America based on local conditions and practices, not the result of mechanistically applying a European formula, which of course is what a lot of the social Democrats did. So thoughts? Huh. Well, uh, when, when you say that uh, last statement, I get perhaps this is out of context, perhaps I need more context, but it sounds a lot like the argument that uh, Marxism is, is just a, a white thing, uh, w which is an argument that liberals use, but, uh, but it, it sounds like this, this person's argument is more like the perspective of, say, the, the Juche idea in Korea, where they have innovated on this, uh, this Marxist, uh, this, this Marxism thing, which was formulated by uh, a European, and uh, they've applied it to their local conditions uh, to build socialism there. Uh, and that this, this is the same basic concept I've seen uh, Juche itself actually embraced throughout uh, much of African revolutionary politics. Uh, and I, I don't know how prominent Juche is in Latin America, but it's the same, it's the same basic logic that all of these places are uh, applying by necessity, given their conditions, given the demand for them to break free from imperial control firstly, and then build socialism uh, where they are. Yeah, well, I don't think Jucheism is uh, uh, very influential in Latin America, although Mariatiguism is highly influential. And, um, of course, I mean, as I said, uh, you know, uh, he died in 1930, uh, Mariatigua. Uh, Mariatiguism far predates Juchism. Um, so if anything, maybe it was the other way around, although um, I have no evidence of that one way or another. Um, this is the, you know, I mean, the idea that uh, Marxism is a white thing. Um, yeah, I mean, the largest single political party in the history of the world is Chinese of any type of political party. That is the Communist Party of China. Uh, Latin America, you know, uh, had the second after uh, after 1949 and the Chinese liberation, as they call it, um, the second major. Uh, Marxist-Leninist revolution after that happened in Cuba, Latin America. Um, all of Latin America is highly, highly influenced by Castroism, which is basi basically just the application of Marxism-Leninism in the context of Latin America, and by Mariatiguism. So, yeah, I mean, these people develop, de develop their own thing. Africa, same thing, you know. Um, Marxism um, is highly adaptable. Marxism-Leninism. Uh, I mean, the whole idea be about Leninism was to refocus Marxism on the uh, global south, on the uh, underdeveloped and developing world as opposed to the developed uh, Europe and North America uh, and the rest of the Anglosphere, which is, uh, you know, Australia and New Zealand and Japan, Japan of course. Um, so um, for that century, for the 20th century, uh, that made perfect sense. Leninism was Marxism for the 20th century. Uh, Mariatiguism was Lenin was Leninism and Marxism for the 20th century, um, adapting to different areas. You know, 
same in China, that uh, uh, Maoism was Marxism-Leninism, period. Mao said that himself. He said, uh, I'm not a Maoist. You know, he's, uh, he basically said, I'm a Marxist-Leninist. So he's applying Marxism-Leninism to the unique circumstances of China. Uh, same thing in, in, in uh, the Democratic Republic of, uh, 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 the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, in other words, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Workers' Party of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of North Korea uh, applied Marxism-Leninism to the unique circumstances of uh, Korea, of that country. Um, that's, uh, you know, that, that's uh, what Marxism and Marxism-Leninism has been. Um, I see no reason for any uh, readaptation other than the fact that uh, it's coming on time for uh, revolutions in uh, the uh, metropolitan center, uh, as the uh, world systems theorists would call it, uh, in the developed countries, as well as in the whole uh, third world, if you want to call it that, or the whole uh, periphery, as the uh, as the world systems Marxists call it. <coughs> um, either way, revolution, socialist revolution, is on the agenda. It's on the way, uh, and um, I think Pedro Castillo's uh, inauguration uh, is just one more. Uh, sign of that same thing. So, anything more on that stuff? Next, colonialism's final form, mercenaries and weaponized surveillance from rainershade.com uh, August 4th, 2021. Take it away, Rainer Shea. Yeah, so I, I published this just last night. There's this huge effort to privatize the instruments of repression, of surveillance, of, uh, of the means of policing the colonized and waging war against the colonized. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this largely began uh, in the so-called Middle East, Southeast Asia, where throughout these last uh, 20 years or so, uh, the U.S. empire has been privatizing war, uh, allowing companies like Blackwater and, uh, and uh, what, what's another one, Triple Canopy to wage war and otherwise help the U.S. empire. And uh, since then, these uh, mercenary tactics, this, uh, this practice of uh, privatizing repressive warfare forces to give uh, warfare an extra layer of impunity has been uh, taken to Latin America. Uh, and now it's uh, starting to be applied to uh, the U.S. itself. This has been going on for quite a while. I mean, in the form of things like the mercenaries policing uh, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, but in these last couple months or so, uh, this mercenary company, we don't know its name, has been policing Minneapolis. It's been assaulting Black Lives Matter protesters. It's been grabbing them, profiling them, uh, surveilling them when they've spoken out about the human rights abuses committed by this private military company. So the mercenaries are on the rise. And this is going to increasingly be the case in the coming decades as the contradictions of capitalism uh, prompt the capitalist state to keep cracking down. What the capitalist state is doing is turning over its counterinsurgency, counterrevolutionary uh, tools over to co corporations, both to give uh, uh, these corporations an extra layer of uh, both, both to give the counterinsurgency an extra layer of impunity uh, 
and to squeeze out more profits from the dying system of capitalism. The same applies to border surveillance. In recent years, the Israeli tech firm Elbit has been building these surveillance towers along the U.S. southern southern border uh, that are capable of uh, monitoring every person and vehicle that's outdoors within a maximum of a maximum radius of 2.5 miles. An entire indigenous community near the southern border is now under total surveillance, and it's been this way for. Uh, I, a couple of years now, uh, from what I understand, it's really traumatizing for this community, and it's uh, upsetting their uh, their ability to practice their cultural traditions for fear of being uh, monitored without their consent. Anyway, in addition to this uh, cultural genocide, uh, there's this deadly impact that uh, this monitoring virtual wall has been having where these migrants fleeing conditions that U.S. imperialism has created down south uh, have been uh, unable to uh, reach safety as they've been traversing these uh, perilous uh, scorching conditions and a lot of them have been dying. Uh, that's the consequence, the human consequence of Biden's uh, supposedly more humanitarian version of uh, the border wall, the virtual wall. And uh, now Canada has been purchasing surveillance drones from Elbit, ignoring Elbit's human rights record. This has gone on while Canada's military has been uh, driving towards acquiring armed drones, same as the United States. These drones are going to be acquired by Canada, likely by 2025 which is alarming. This is uh, U.S. NATO imperialism turning inwards and bringing in its nastiest tools for counterinsurgency against the colonized. Yeah, this, uh, this uh, use of mercenaries uh, that's uh, become more and more apparent, it's obvious that the U.S. is not getting out of uh, Afghanistan, for example. They're just using uh, mercenaries in place of uh, American uh, uh, military. And uh, the other thing that's really a big deal now is uh, drones. I think more and more we're going to see as the next 10 years unfold and we get to the point where uh, AI, in other words, uh, uh, computer programs that uh, are able to uh, think and become aware and become uh, smarter than Americans, uh, uh, human beings, uh, that's going to happen in the next 10 years. We're on the road to it now. Everything says, if you read about uh, <clears throat> the development of computer technology, and once you've got those uh, AIs that are capable of doing what an, uh, a human does, all you need is a robot to put them in. Uh, that's the easy part because they've already got that. Uh, all, and uh, you don't need mercenaries anymore. So these mercenaries will be out of jobs 10 years from now. It'll be, uh, this, this will be uh, uh, Skynet. I don't know, do you remember Skynet? Skynet was the uh, corporation that created the... Uh, the, the uh, automated uh, warfare, the automated uh, weaponry that was used in the Terminator movies. Um, and uh, this, is this is Skynet happening in front of us right now. It's a scary thing. Um, we'll be just like the people on uh, Terminator. We will be fighting, you know, advanced Terminator systems that are uh, able to outthink us, outmaneuver us, uh, stronger than us. Uh, and that's what uh, the future brings and is not far away. 
I mean, 10 years, hell, I might even be alive 10 years from now. Uh, this is what we've got to look forward to. These are just some of the reasons. You've delineated them just uh, very well. It's a great article, by the way. Uh, you've delineated just some of the reasons why socialist revolution on a global scale, revolution that can bring down imperial, uh, uh, bring down all imperial forces, in particular the hegemon of imperial forces, the American empire. Uh, this needs to be brought down before this uh, dystopian nightmare scape is, becomes a reality. We've all seen the Terminator movies. Uh, these ass wipes, these putrid criminals like Biden, like Trump, like Obama, uh, who have been creating this uh, right under our fucking noses. And now Biden is pretending that he's withdrawing American, uh, America from uh, Afghanistan at the same time that a massive major bombing campaign has been going on in just this last week or two in Afghanistan. That doesn't sound like a withdrawal, does it? These people are such criminals. And as you say, scary, scary, scary thing. They're bringing it home to us. Uh, we've really got to do something. Wake up, people. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, we've got to accelerate. You know, global warming's accelerating. Uh, the march towards nuclear holocaust is accelerating. The march towards uh, genocide by the American empire on its own uh, origin country is, is, is on the march, is accelerating. We're dealing with acceleration on a lot of levels and we really need to accelerate uh, organizing for the global socialist revolution. Enough said. Next point, uh, global apocalypse. Is that where we're at? Uh, yeah. Global apocalypse, the global apocalypse, I'm sorry, that the imperialists are engineering from July 31st, 2021, uh, RainerShay.com. Take it away, Rainer. Bolivia model uh, is becoming increasingly prevalent in the operations of the U.S. empire. Ten years ago, the U.S., and France invaded Libya. They, they bombed the richest democracy in Africa at the time into non-existence, and made Libya into a failed state with slave trades. Uh, and this wasn't, uh, this, this seemingly wasn't Obama's intention. He seemingly intended to uh, create some kind of nation building project for Libya parallel to uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, but obviously even in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, whatever nations that they've tried to build have uh, <laughs> been in the context of overwhelming guerrilla warfare from anti-occupation forces. So when they tried to occupy these, these countries, it's spectacularly failed uh, on, like, on like every level. Uh, sustained only through constant corruption and CIA bribery of the leadership, places like Afghanistan. Uh, so they, perhaps for this reason, they didn't try that in Libya and they uh, left it, they, they abandoned Libya after destroying it to a hellish paradigm that's gone on for the last decade. Uh, Obama admitted that this was is the greatest failure of his presidency, uh, but uh, but it was um, a turning point for the strategies of U.S. imperialism, where instead of even trying to nation build, they just blew apart an entire society and uh, allowed it to have slave trades. Uh, they didn't even try to fix the uh, damage they wrought. Yeah, I, 
You know, I'm and now this strategy is being tried to what? No, I'm sorry. I, I, you froze and I didn't realize you froze. So, uh, I didn't realize you were in the middle. Go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, this, uh, this dynamic of the U.S. empire, uh, intending to uh, create some new neo-colonial government in place of the governments that they've overthrown and then failing at this and then throwing up their hands and uh, allowing these places to be destabilized is getting expanded into broader Africa, the Horn of Africa, where uh, the U.S. empire's strategy for manufacturing destabilization with the uh, initial intent of uh, creating a new, more stable neo-colonial government in, uh, in these Horn of Africa countries has been failing, and the U.S. empire has uh, essentially been cutting their losses uh, in response to these failures and allowing these places to uh, languish in their instability and their violence. That's, that's the essence of what the imperialists are doing as uh, their global hegemony wanes, as the climate crisis uh, intensifies as global inequality uh, exacerbates the contradictions of capitalism and colonialism. As destabilization becomes ever more unavoidable, the imperialists are just cutting their losses and letting these uh, impoverished places, or uh, they used to not even be impoverished, like in Libya, these, they're letting these places languish in uh, instability. And this is constantly being expanded from the Horn of Africa to the other parts of Africa, like how Biden uh, recently drone striked Somalia, uh, which is on the other side of the continent. And they're also expanding it into Latin America, where in Haiti this last month, they've gotten their Colombian mercenaries to assassinate the unpopular dictator there uh, so that they can create a precedent for more intervention. Uh, and this is going to no doubt result in uh, years more violence and uh, poverty and so on. They're trying to apply that to uh, Cuba. They're, they're doing their best by paying these desperate Cubans uh, to sabotage infrastructure, gas stations, crops. They're paying these Cubans to commit terrorist attacks. This is a calculated destabilization attempt against Cuba. I doubt it's going to work, but that's something to note. And uh, mercenaries are coming up in this discussion again because the Cuban government believes that mercenaries, U.S. financed mercenaries, have been behind these anti-communist terrorist attacks in Cuba. And so we uh, keep seeing this series of trends. More mercenaries, uh, more instability. Uh, and, you know, instability and mercenaries are uh, historical fixtures of dying empires. Yeah, uh, this, uh, I personally, I'm not convinced that um, in the last 15 years, at least, that uh, the uh, American uh, capitalist ruling class has had as a subjective nation building in any place where it attacks. Um, I mean, I don't know what Obama has said since then, uh, you know, to cover his ass, so to speak, or to, uh, you know, apologize for what happened or whatnot. But certainly since their failed attempt to nation build in Iraq, which was a, like a farce. I mean, it was a joke. Um, I think they've totally given up on that. I think that they look at this solely as punishment. This is a way for them to punish uh, those countries that refuse to kowtow to their hegemony. Um, they figure if these countries are not kowtowing to us, then they're not part of our empire anyway. Might as well destroy them. That's what they seem to be doing. And now, uh, they, as you rightly point out, they intend to bring home this uh, policy to uh, Americans who uh, refuse to kowtow to uh, the empire. 
Um, yeah, you know, Obama's full of shit, in other words. I mean, Obama knew exactly what the fuck he was doing when he went in in 2011 and destroyed the most po- prosperous country, uh, except for maybe South Africa, the most populous, po- prosperous country in Africa, and certainly the, mo- the, the best country to live in in Africa. Uh, Libya, uh, up till 2011, they knew exactly what they were doing. They wanted to destroy the example of Arab socialism. Simple as that. <clears throat> so anyway, next on the list, China's new campaign to enforce rules and social justice on private capital. Um these new rules, these new regulations uh, were passed uh, by the Chinese Congress last year and went into effect uh, January 1st of this year, January 1st, 2021. Um, and it's a whole slew of new regulations uh, that uh, are an attempt by uh, the uh, People's Republic of China to curb the worst excesses of criminality among private or within private enterprise in that country um, and to uh, impose some social justice uh, and some justice against these criminals. Now, in the last week or two, you've been hearing about this all over the American media uh, and I imagine the European media and the Anglosphere media. Um, You've been hearing about this in the context of uh, the uh, huge companies, many of them American owned companies that offer uh, tutorial uh, services and um, uh, private uh, education services. This has become a real big business in China, and China has uh, had enough of uh, this privatization of something that should never, ever be privatized. Nothing about education in any country, even in a capitalist country, nothing about education should ever be privatized. So, so that's been the latest. Um, the last uh, few days, there was a uh, <coughs> drop in the stock prices. <coughs> Excuse me. There was a job, drop in the stock prices of these educational, private educational uh, corporations in China, uh, many of whom are listed on the Chinese uh, stock markets. And uh, so the Americans are making a big deal out of that. Um, the uh, 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 Global Times, one of the two major uh, newspapers, uh, English language newspapers of the uh, Chinese Communist Party, um, did an editorial where they just explained what these, what all the various uh, new regulations to curb the excesses of private enterprise are really all about and what they're aimed at, at which is basically strengthening uh, China's economy, uh, strengthening uh, and, re- and building the global economy, and most importantly, standing up to the acts of war uh, by the uh, American um, by the American uh, empire against China uh, that they call sanctions. And sanctions, make no doubt about it, only the United Nations is allowed under uh, international law to be imposing sanctions on other countries unilaterally. Uh, the, U- the UN is allowed to do that if the UN votes for that. But the United States is not allowed to do that under international law. It is a violation of law. Uh, One more way where the United States is a uh, rogue nation, a lawbreaker, uh, and uh, China's new 
regulations uh, regulating private enterprise are designed to ensure that these sanctions aren't reaching inside China and using the uh, minority of private enterprises in China. They do not constitute the majority of Chinese enterprises, but to use them against uh, the Chinese people. So that's what's really going on um, <clears throat> on that. Rainer? Right. You know, uh, this week, there were these headlines uh, from the U.S. media that were making it seem like it was an ominous thing for a uh, Chinese actor uh, to be arrested for sexual assault. Like they, they, were, they were saying that uh, <laughs> like they, were, they were putting these uh, uh, seemingly alarming quotes from the Chinese government. Uh, like, uh, like your passport, uh, your, if you have a passport that won't protect you, uh, you, uh, you're, you're not safe. <laughs> so, uh, even with the, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's so outrageous. Uh, e even when they were, they were, uh, acknowledging the context, these, uh, the, these headlines from the U S were trying to make it seem like uh like this uh, is a harbinger for uh, some kind of repressive campaign against uh public figures within china when it all it is is uh them trying to rectify uh the abuses that take place in entertainment in the entertainment industry uh and you know con contrast that with the united states where uh, prior to when Harvey Weinstein was caught, uh, he had his own private network of spies who were designated with the, the job of uh, trying to keep his victims silent. Yeah, uh, it, I, I don't know if they have. I doubt they have the equivalent of that in China. No, I don't think so either. Good point. Um, next. Um... CGTN, the China Global TV Network, which uh, has a, an American version, which you can see on many uh, cable and uh, cable uh, networks, and uh, on uh, the uh, two major uh, uh, satellite networks. Um, it's a great uh, source of uh, news and information. Anyway, they did a poll. Um, now, we've been talking about uh, the demand worldwide that uh, the uh, World Health Organization investigate Fort Detrick, Maryland, uh, the place where many people are starting to believe uh, where uh, COVID-19 uh, originated. Um, Coronaviruses didn't originate there. I mean, they came from bats, I think. But it's get, becoming more and more likely that the American uh, 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 bioweapons <coughs> um, that come out of, of Fort Detrick um, were uh, the cause of COVID-19. Um, anyway, CGTN this past week did a poll uh, a global poll of their uh, of, of people uh, uh, from all over the world, and globally, eighty three percent say the U.S. origins of COVID nineteen should be investigated by the WHO. So um, there's a little bit more progress on that same story that we've been related that we've related to you in the last two episodes of uh, RSR. Rainer? Yeah, we've been on this topic uh, since it first became relevant, since uh, people started speculating in early 2020 about the idea of some kind of biological warfare being afoot. And, it, you know, uh, the, the case for that is, is always, it always has merit when it comes to the United States, since the United States 
was born out of biological warfare with the uh, with the in indigenous genocide, and the U.S. has used biological warfare against numerous target countries like uh, like Cuba, Korea. Uh, but but uh, but what has been uh, kind of mind blowing if it's true that this was uh, proliferated with the negligence of the U.S. government is that this, this virus has greatly exacerbated the contradictions of capitalism. The impacts of this pandemic uh, have, have been, on, on the one hand, the impacts have been for the richest uh, people in the U.S. to collectively become over a trillion dollars wealthier uh, they've been able to consolidate their wealth and power. But on the other hand, this has brought the revolution or the prospect of revolution in this country a lot closer. So uh, even if this was some kind of crazy conspiracy so, uh, that they've, they've masterminded, uh, <laughs> even if they, want, uh, they wanted this chaos in the U.S. from the pandemic all along, if they were willing to accept the deaths of, uh, was it over six hundred thousand people in the U.S.? Yes. Even if they wanted all this to happen, they've still brought their demise a lot closer. Yeah, um, yeah, they've lost a lot of points here, and they're losing points. Next on the list, the hellscape the U.S. plans to bring to its own people. Rainer Shea, July twenty ninth. There's uh, a picture I've been gaining of the kind of environment that the United States is going to engineer within its own borders when the revolutionary crisis comes to a head here. Uh, they're going to import uh, their most severe tactics for repression, for counterinsurgency, for surveillance, uh, they're going to apply methods against uh, their own people. And uh, studying the way this, this has looked in places like uh, Iraq uh, during the, the siege on Fallujah, for instance, if I'm pronouncing that city right, yeah, uh, you are. the situation that the imperialists have brought about has been collective punishment, where they've, uh, they've been economically cutting off uh, entire populations where they've been cutting entire populations off from food. They've been carrying out raids, blockades, uh, random terrorism that's, uh, that's designed not to uh, carry out some, even some kind of twisted sense of justice, but uh, merely to uh, frighten the general population into submission. This is what they've been doing in Afghanistan for the last two decades with uh, actually far longer than that, with their CIA orchestrated death squads that have been carrying out horrific war crimes against civilians who are simply suspected, uh, not even based on real evidence in a lot of cases, of helping the Taliban. The, the CIA death squads have uh, burnt down homes, including homes with uh, children in them. They've executed entire families all on a whim, all for the sake of collective punishment, of uh, slightly reducing the possibility that the rebels will uh, gain more ground. And of, of course, uh, even these most extreme tactics have not succeeded at keeping the Taliban at bay. The Taliban has actually uh, become increasingly victorious, lar uh, largely as a result of these terrorist imperialist tactics uh, because the Taliban has been able to make the case to the population there that they're better off helping the Taliban than surrendering to the corruption and uh, tyranny of the U.S. occupation, uh, which is something that we could replicate the equivalent of here and that we could make a good case to the people on this continent in our communities, that uh, they would be better off uh, helping a hypothetical series of rebel groups uh, gain jurisdiction.
jurisdiction, uh, take jurisdiction away from the United States government rather than remaining loyal to the United States government and uh, allowing for these terrorist uh, tactics to be brought into their communities. Wow. Uh, that was the perfect recap for the entire show. <laughs> and I don't really need to say any more than that. So with that, <clears throat> that brings us to an end. Uh, to the end of another episode of our SR, our Revolutionary Socialist Review. So, uh, Rainer, thank you so much for the stupendous contributions you made tonight and that you are always making. Uh, keep your uh, prolific writing going because it is sorely needed. Uh, and thank you to all of our listeners and watchers out there keep on coming we'll be back next week with another episode in the meantime i bid you all a sweet adieu